We just seem to can't get enough of these teachers yelling at students. And I can't seem to get enough of students not being a bystander, getting out their fucking phones and filming it the whole damn fucking time. The reason that is is because you, they don't want to get involved. With fight, with the fights, it's just as simple as, hey, I'm going to film this and get a million hits on YouTube and TikTok, whatever. That's the purpose. That's the kid's purpose. Someone, I mean, that's one side. The other side, be like, oh my gosh, there's a fight going on. I need to step in and break it up. There you go. It's as simple as breaking up a fight. What about this? Well, let's take a look at it. See, when a teacher yelled at an autistic student with some common sense. Here's some common sense perspective of how it should have happened. How it should have happened was like this. Hey, hey, what's going on here? And if anyone said, oh, there's bullying going on, that would have, it would have been with a warning first saying, Ethan, if I catch you bullying him again, you're going to be written up. Do you understand? It happens again. This time, it should have been followed. It should have been followed through, and said, "Ethan, I told you to stop bullying. You didn't listen to me. So now, I'm gonna write you a referral. I'm gonna write. I'm gonna write you up. Follow through with a write up. Wrote the referral and sent to the office. Detention. Detention for 60, 90, 120 minutes. It would have. It would have been taught a lot. That would have been. That would have helped. But no, this teacher had to go in there and say, "Hey." Stop doing that. You're going to get punched in the face one day. It's like teaching... that That's a horrible lesson to teach kids. I mean, as parents... Parents teach their dad... Most importantly, dad teaches the son how to stand up to bullies. By taking them to the YMCA. Learning how to defend themselves. I mean, thanks a lot for paying my karate classes. It, I sure will help. I mean... You fight the bully up in the meeting, it's like... Come on, I mean, it's like, it's like this. Imagine going to YMCA and learning how to defend yourself. They learn the same moves on that, they do the same moves on that bully. They get called to the office and the parents are like, well, my, my son was just defending himself, this and this. And you can get rewarded by going to a PG-13 random movie. <laughs> if this is, if this ain't like King of the Hill where Bobby just starts kicking people in the groin. That's my purse. I don't know you. <laughs> That's how it is. It's as simple as, hey, 
enough is enough. How this that's how it should have been handled. Instead of him yelling yelling at him and saying, hey, what's going on? Let's go back to the video and look at the comments section. Because I know this is probably raging with comments. So let's look at some. This says over 2,000 comments, but let's look at some. Get some help. They're really making fun of you with crying. That's disrespectful. I hate teachers like that. I'm with you. Blooper. Blooper iPod. Blooper iPod. It's such to see everyone else is laughing. The fact that everyone is laughing makes makes this more harder than it already is. Honestly, he should went about this the wrong way, but the lesson he's given them is very helpful. Okay? From my experience and law enforcement class seen, seen before, you never scream at an autistic child. Never, ever. There's common, There's your common sense right there. No way, not even me. I have kids, well, adults have autism. The only thing that only shuts them down or makes them lash out. Funny enough, I have autism. You shout at us, but not like that. Same as have Asperger's. Cry about it. I had to agree with that comment. You never ever yell. What is wrong? That teacher should have been suspended with pay or fired for that or being retrained. It's just how it is. It never stops. Still ahead, body cam break with drunk, with drunk drivers and sub, and with with the uh, with the tests that they do. How does it work? And how does it work? Stay with us. Time for a new series on the broadcast. We're calling Focus Break. It was in, it's inspired. It was inspired from NBC Nightly News, where each like Sunday Focus or In Focus. Focus Break is going to be focusing focusing on issues that are that are around the world. We'll be doing things like whistleblowers, homelessness, and tech and technology, like on the cutting edge. It's also inspired from Eye on America. If you have any new segment names, I like I like to hear with the word break in it. So in Focus Break this tonight, we're focusing on the homeless on homelessness. It's all over Austin, which is why back in 2021. House Bill 1925 was created. That's the ban camping, which which prohibits people from camping un, in public places without consent, meaning under the bridge and in the downtown area. City ordinance has the city ordinance here in Corpus Christi has made ordinances of sleeping on the sidewalk and on the bus benches, which is why if you walk downtown in the areas of the downtown district, the islands, and here in Flower Bluff, you would see the suspenders that are being that were put in place. To prevent sleeping on the benches. But it's it's happening more and more in Austin, which which pushed lawmakers to make that House Bill, 1925. If you want to review that, you go to statutes.capital.texas.gov, type in, you click on Penal Code, Chapter 48, then Section 48.05 of the Penal Code. That's where the law begins. On House Bill 1925. Take a look. Was there a piece of this issue that when you walked into this job, you said, we need to change how we're doing this? I think when we look at our homeless response system holistically, the, the key challenge here is our system needs to scale. You know, we know that we need an additional 772 emergency shelter beds to get people into shelter. We do have some beds that are currently being developed and expanded. You know, recently the city doubled our capacity at our bridge shelters, which is the North Bridge and the South Bridge shelter. We also opened up the Marshalline Yard, which has a capacity of 300 deaths. And then we're working with two, the other ones foundation, to expand their capacity at Camp Esperanza. But even after all that work is said and done, we still have that gap of 772. And so, frankly, we're looking for opportunities for more shelter. And so if there are folks out there that are interested in engaging with the city in that way, please reach out to our team and, and let us know. I understand there's a goal of uh, a little over 1,400 beds by 2025, so is it fair to say we're about halfway there? It, it's fair to say that. You look back over the last 
I guess several years. In 2019, we had the ordinance allowing camping on the streets. Two years later, the people voted uh, to reinstate the camping ban, and now we're two years beyond that. Uh, what goes through your mind? What kind of progress has been made? I think we're making some good progress when it comes to engaging with unhoused residents and trying to move them into shelter. And that's a critical part of the engagement strategy around encampments. Certainly, visually, you can see that difference. I mean, if you think about, you know, driving through downtown or driving along I-35, that area underneath it, how much work has gone into to affecting that change? We have a team that's called the Homeless Encampment Management Team, and it's a cross-departmental collaboration. And what we're doing is we're working as one city to engage with unsheltered individuals to clean camps and ultimately to move people into shelter or into housing. So it's a significant amount of work and we're, we're going to continue to do that work until we connect everybody with shelter or with a housing opportunity. How would you respond to some of the concerns that have been raised about what's happening or what may be happening in some of the shelters? So I know recently there were some concerns that were raised specifically around our Northbridge shelter and we are looking into that. We've launched a, a formal investigation that I that's still ongoing, so I can't speak to the specifics right now. But since I took this role, I've spent many days working out of the Northbridge shelter, working with our staff to look at our procedures and our protocols, and I've been pleased with what I've seen. One thing I want to ask you, how big of an issue is mental health and substance use when it comes to homelessness? There's a strong correlation. I will say that's not everybody's challenge. Some people's challenges can be quickly resolved. However, the longer they're allowed to stay uh, on the street, and the longer they have to live on the street, the more traumatic their homelessness experience becomes. You know, we have some great partners in our region with uh, Central Health and Integral Care and others who play a major role in the space of mental health services. Do you think there are enough resources, enough treatment to meet that moment? You know, when we look at our homeless response system, I think every area of our homeless response system needs to scale up to meet the challenge that, that we're faced with and to serve the, the population that we're called to serve. And so that's for mental health and substance use disorder, that's for housing and shelter services, that's for helping people get state IDs, right? Like every part of the system needs to be more heavily invested in and scaled up so that we can help the community that uh, is unhoused. David Gray, Interim Homeless Strategy Officer with the City of Austin. David, thanks so much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you, John. Take care. And you can watch my full interview with Homeless Strategy Officer David Gray starting tomorrow on the Fox 7 YouTube page and at fox7austin.com. We'll be right back. I think this guy has a point. I mean, we need that officer in we every homeless officer in every in every county in in the state I mean there's one in Austin I mean David Gray if you have the time because I know it's all in Austin I would love for you to come down to Corpus Christi to see the homelessness population and here in Fire Bluff and meet Mr. Joe Kramer who was the creator of Taking Back the Bluff which their goal and mission is to help is to uh, make sure about these vagrants and all. I mean, it's, it's very different, but you make it the picture. So, David Gray, for watching this, I invite you to come down. Coming up on our next focus, our next focus to be all coming up on coming up on our next focus break, which is going to be on next Saturday. A focus break will happening every Saturday. I call it Saturday Focus Break. Our next Saturday focus break is all about the whistleblower. What is it? And who has blown the whistle so many times? We'll give you an example. We'll give you an example on Saturday. Coming up next. There is now, there's now advocates that are saying they are, being, they are against school vouchers. Like we talked about. We talked about school choice, but people are saying yay, and people are saying nay. We'll, we'll hear from some of the public advocates. And still ahead, there's body cam, there's still body cam footage that would show, that shows all about drunk drivers who are being pulled over and failing tests 
and thinking that they can get their way out of this, like we saw. Stay with us. Almost a week ago, we talked about school competition, meaning giving kids a choice. It was all about the school vouchers. If you didn't know what a school voucher was, it was to where the money would be attached to the kids, and they can, and with that money, they can select any school they want, like a private school, a Catholic school, school uniforms, anything. We talk, I also talked about how competition makes everything better. How some people are with it and some people are against it. We focused in on one superintendent that is for this and some politicians who are against it. It's like the rich versus the poor. But in Austin, there are people out there who say, we don't need that. I want what's best for my kids. Like this protest here. My Texas public school taught me to vote. It was a protest that happened in Austin. Let's take a look. Fellow Texans gathered together at the steps of the Capitol Saturday afternoon. Sorry about that. No problem. Don't think I came without a backup plan here, folks. Don't you dare think I come out here without a backup plan here. And you may know, you may not hear it, but... Like I talked about, there are, some, there are some protesters here that are against public education. Let's take a look. Fellow Texans gathered together at the steps of the Capitol Saturday afternoon with a message to Governor Greg Abbott. special session on taxpayer funder vouchers called for on Monday, October 9th. Public educator advocates want voters to vote no on private school vouchers. Question right now shouldn't be about private school vouchers. There should be better quality of education and better financial support of the public education system. In a statement, Governor Greg Abbott says in part, together we will chart a brighter future for all Texas children by empowering parents to choose the best education option for their child. But during Saturday's rally, advocates believe vouchers will harm the community. Every organizational structure, public schools in Texas have their own set of complications. However, if I could go back and start all over again, I would still choose to enroll in public education. Leander ISD Superintendent Bruce Gearing spoke at the rally he says vouchers take away accountability. In Leander ISD, we are fully transparent. Unlike private schools, we are governed by a locally elected board of trustees who make decisions in meetings that are open to the public. Advocates were asked to bring Boots to the rally to leave a statement, boot the vouchers, and save Texas public schools. After the rally, advocates left those boots at the Governor Mansion's gates. And here we are with Access Education, Round Rock ISD, and we're here to send a message to Governor Greg Abbott. We're saying we are going to give the boot to vouchers, and we're supporting our public education. Fully fund our Round Rock ISD schools. At the Capitol, I'm Jessica Rivera, Fox 7 Austin News. 
Give them the boot. Give them the boot. Well, give me a break. Give me a break. Common sense alert. What is wrong with these people? They're thinking like, oh, you know, we don't like we don't like vouchers. Let's give them the boot. Listen, it's competition. Like I talked about, like I talked about, like I talked about a week ago. Competition is good. Not in public education, they hate it. I mean, back in back in back like like in two thousand five or six, Julian Stahl was governor of Greg Abbott, and he was governor of the of Carolina of South Carolina. And he had he had the same plan that Greg Abbott had. Before, he had the same he had the plan before Greg Abbott imposed the plan in Texas. But school boards objected. Teachers unions and even PTA sent home letters to parents, home to kids, saying, "Contact your legislator. How can we spend state money on a plan that's not even recognized?" The whole reasoning behind this is basically, "Hey, it has not worked." When basically test scores have dropped, the score, the test scores have dropped for these for all these reasons. And like I talked, and like I talked about, school spending has tripled. For all for over forty years, the scores have been flat. You get a lot more money, but no improvements. Charter schools spend less than what the public school makes. It's the old scale. Charter schools spend less, public schools spend more. I'm gonna be getting a lot of comments on this episode because of everything that I said. And he's like, in comments like saying, oh, he's against public education. Like, like once I, oh, he's, like, oh, he's against public education. He never went to school. Other side would be saying, I support what he says, so I'm going to choose, I'm choosing for vouchers. Okay, well, if people going to be saying, well, if people are going to be saying like, okay, he's made a choice. I mean, I went to school. School can be boring, but it can be fun. Reading is work. Math is work. It's teaching. We we can use math everywhere to solve problems in the world. Reading, like when we go on a drive, we learn like we learn to read. We talked. We also talked about Beth Beth Boss, who who says, you know what? Kids can learn to read if the child is ready. Preschool should have been called that. They should have called it socialization skills. Because if you don't teach your child how to socialize by age six, they're not going to learn how to negotiate at all. They're going to be out there doing some small talk. You know, I mean, that's what we, that's what schools don't teach is socialization, social skills. If you don't teach your kids social skills by age six, they're going to be out there small talking and not having a good conversation. There's gonna be out there being quiet and not and just mingle a bit. But the thing here, here the thing here is, I mean, it's like, okay, well, well, which side do you pick? I'm not picking sides. I'm not against public education or these vouchers. Although vouchers is a great idea. If you're saying, you might be saying, oh, you're sticking with vouchers. I'm not. I'm not saying that I'm sticking with both. All I'm saying is, as parents, we want what's best for our kids. That's the common sense perspective here. We all want what's best for our kids. I want what's best for my nephew or niece. A great education. So that he or she can just go to school and learn. Find a good public school in your state. And like, if you live in Fire Bluff, you're zoned in Fire Bluff. What if you live in the CCISD area? Well, if you live in the CCISD area, you go to school in CCISD. If you live on like Weber and all, Yorktown, if you live in like Yorktown, or whatever, you're probably going to Venice Memorial, which is also part of CCISD. Carol, Moody. Carol, you got Moody, you have Veterans Memorial. 
You live in Victoria, Tulsa, Midway, then you're in the Tulsa, Midway area. The bottom line here is this. I mean, don't be going up there, giving them the boot and saying, hey, you know, I don't want my kids... I really don't want my kids to be money to be attached because they could just steal it right away. Is that what you're worried about? You're worried about money? That's what people are worried about. They're worried about the money. That's what they are. I mean, the money being attached to the kids, I mean, it's what's best for the child. Parent, kids can make a choice. And you parents are saying, well I, well, I don't want my child to choose his own education. He's not an adult yet. Charter schools are good. And I'm suggesting your child to stick to a charter school that spends, to go to a school that spends less money. I support the charter schools. Kevin Chavis, who was on Stupid in America, he talked about, he talked about the reasons why. He says that public schools lie, saying, I mean, schools are saying, like, oh, we just need more money. That's the biggest lie in America, he said. They waste money. And his school, he saves less. If you boost scores up, you spend less money. If you spend more money, the scores get boosted down, drop hard. It affects funding and teacher salaries. If you remember the no child left behind rule, it was to where principals were held accountable. Principals and administrators were held accountable by how well schools did. And did that have to do with the teachers? I guess so. That was just in Houston schools, from what the TEA had and resulted in way back in 2000, like in 2002 during pres former President George Bush's No Child Left Behind Education Reform Act. Again, I was to work principals being held accountable. So, what do you have here? You have a system to where you would have to choose. It's like a fork in a road. Do you take a left or do you take a right? Left is bad, right is good. If you go to the left side, the left side is public education. On the right side, you're choosing a school with less money and what's best for your child. Is that the same thing on the left? Well, it could depend on how well schools do. Here's what I would do. If you're going to pick a school for your child, I would recommend by doing, by having some prior knowledge or doing some research beforehand. That way you know. So if you're thinking about, so before school starts, before the, before the age, before age five, what I would do before then is, is something like this. I would look up, go on here, I would go on, go online and find a best, look up suitable schools for my child or best school, pu best public school for my child. I mean, if it means, it, like, you may be asking, well, does it mean we have to move? It does, it does mean you have to move. Have a backup plan put in place. That, have like a, have like backup plans put in place. Have a plan A, B, C, and or have a plan A, B, and or C, and or D put in place. That way you know, like, okay, if this school doesn't work, I'm transferring my child to this school, to that school. If that school doesn't work, I'm transferring my child to, to C. If C don't work, I'm transferring my child to D. If D doesn't work, then I'm homeschooling my child. Or online school. The reason why kids are being transferred out is because they're being bullied. 
I mean, if one school didn't do that, they were in the next school. Same thing. It never ends because, as we talked about in our previous broadcasts, bullying never stops in these schools. It's like Trisha Yearwood and, uh, and, uh, Don Henley say that that boy's just a walk away Joe. Born to be a leader. And I don't know the rest of the lyrics. All right, before we go on break here, let's find out there's been more bullying in our schools. Look at a new resource for look, look, look at let's look at a new anti-bullying resource. Teens are reported being bullied in the past year, according to new numbers. And of those who were bullied, 65% say that bullying impacted their mental health and their confidence. And on the heels of those stats, we wanted to bring students and parents a first-of-its-kind resource to deal with bullying. Joining us live with more on the Choose Kindness Project is psychologist Dr. Yala Uls. Good morning to you. Good morning, Bill. It's great to have you. So tell us about the Choose Kindness Project and how this got started. It got started to really try to shift our culture towards choosing kindness. The story you just was reporting on is an example of that. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, so many kids are bullied. Social media has amplified some of those effects. And we put together an alliance of leading organizations that try to support young people and teach them how to be, you know, kind and, and you know, teach them how to stand up for others and teach them how to, um, you know, through schools and different places, teach adults how to support these people. So we put together parenting resources um, on the choosekindnessproject.org that supports parents and caregivers to help their child if they've been bullied. Is there any indication just how bad or widespread bullying has become? Um, well, you just gave the statistic of a third um, as, as, you know, bullying has been around forever. So I, you know, and bullying is part of life. I mean, especially during puberty and early adolescence. Um, what we're trying to do is counter those effects, um, in particular in a world where bullying, you know, follows you home from the schoolyard on social media and digital media, text, group text, you know, people can publicly post things. Um, those effects are really strong and could impact mental health and so what we're trying to do is help parents and people in young kids lives model kindness teach it help them if they are being bullied help them if they are the bully hurt people hurt other people so you know some kids might be bullying because they're hurt it's, and we want them to choose kindness so instead teaching having the adults in their lives support them um, in learning how to be kind to others and you've developed some resources in response to reports of bullying can you tell us about that yeah, so the resources are these three parenting playbooks on choosekindnessproject.org. Um, they basically took all of the resources from these organizations, everything that's out there on the web. We chose the best ones. We made them very concise, and we addressed parenting needs. So we help parents identify whether their child is a bully or is being bullied. We help parents figure out how to talk to their child, talk, talk to their schools. If there's a specific 
issue, if a kid is older, younger, a different identity group, we have resources for that. And we put it in this very concise book um, that is downloadable for free. You can read it on your phone. Um, we also have resources for teachers, for educators, and also for those parents who may not have had to deal with bullying but want to teach culture, create a culture of kindness and compassion in their home. Such powerful tools. Great message as well. Dr. Yelda Uls, thank you so much. Appreciate thank your you time. so much for having me. And you can find more information on the Choose Kindness Project on our website, fox13seattle.com. I think it's a great tool for everybody to use. Parents, teachers, students, and for this broadcast. Come up on and we're gonna take a look at this we're gonna take a look at this project, what it means, and that downloadable book that she just mentioned. Because I think it's a great tool. And I think she raised she raised the obvious common sense ever. So let's give three cheers to this person who really gave out the basic common sense. Hip hip hooray, hip hip hooray, and hip hip hooray for her. I'm not being sarcastic. She did great. We'll take a look at that on Monday. But basically, when kids are bullying other kids, they're being hurt. It's what's inside. Like Alan Harper says, we judge a person by what's inside, not what they wear. Your heart has feelings as well. There's more, like Sora from Kingdom Hearts says, there's more to our heart than just anger or hate. It's full of our, all kinds of feelings. Happiness. Sadness. Rage. Frustration. It's not just in the eyebrows. It's what's in your heart. And that's what that, that's what's created a strong heart. And what, that's, that's what makes a strong and bigger heart. By caring, being kind, and being nice. That's how I got this heart. This heart is full of kindness, lifting spirits, and telling people that you'll be there and that and that, and that you made a promise. That's exactly what I've learned while playing Kingdom Hearts. A great video game ever. You can like every time you play Kingdom Hearts or watch the cutscenes, you could learn a lot from Kingdom Hearts. By playing the Kingdom Hearts games, you can learn a lot. And I do mean a lot from these video games. But with that being said and all, I mean, like I've talked about previous times, I recommend that your child play Bully. Video game all about people being Bully. But... And probably just, uh, won't be the whole case here, but, um, we'll play Bully on our next door by Thursday. So, uh, that may be the day. I'll be right back with drunk driving body cams. Stay with us. Can you imagine somebody behind the wheel of a car is none other than the mayor of your town? In Ohio, that's what happened. Somebody that you trust is the mayor. Let's take a look at this body cam footage. And like I said before, the internet is down, so an alternative here. An alternative here because I don't have the plug in. But if I did... But if I did, I would plug it in here, but it doesn't work. So if I had the plug in, I would just switch over here, and then we start over again. So I'm sticking to this until we can figure until I can figure something down here. Let's take a look. traffic stop turns into a brief high-speed chase after an Ohio woman appears disoriented behind the wheel. It happened on September 27th in Parma, Ohio. Body cam video captures a Parma police officer approaching a woman's vehicle for a traffic stop. Hello. Hi. Um, let's go and pull this parking lot. That sound good? Okay. No. What's that? 
I guess you're going 43 out of 25. The officer then informs the woman her plates expired, but she still refuses to cooperate. Do you have a driver's license with you? No. Okay. Where's your driver's license at? No. No. The woman the officer is questioning was later identified as a former Northeast Ohio area mayor named Kathy Lux. Go put the car in park. Okay, put the car in park. After pretending to comply with the officer's request, she drives off sending the officer into a short-lived chase. Speed's about 65. And she made a right-hand turn on the burger and crashed into a truck. The officer is able to catch up to Lux after she crashed into a tow truck. Get up. Get up. Wait, 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 wait. 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 Get up. I want... The officer eventually is able to cuff Lux so he can put her inside the back of the police squad car. Get up there. Have a seat. I have a What you're doing is wrong. Thank you. Okay, have a seat. What you're doing is wrong. Come on. I want my stuff. I will. Get up. Have a seat. No, I want my stuff. Oh, no, we gotta get up here. It's not how it works. Come on. Listen. Let me have a seat. No. No. Let me tell you. Put your foot up there. Set up. Yeah, let me That's how it you. works. Lux appearing confused while handcuffed, then takes the opportunity to tell the officer of her previously elected position that she held from 1999 to 2007. Could I, could I, could I Lux was cited for operating a vehicle while intoxicated, driving with an open container, speeding, and driving with expired plates. Lux was ultimately booked into jail, but released the next day. Court records show she still has an open case from the incident of failing to comply with an officer. Reporting for Long Crime Network, I'm Elizabeth Milner. Okay, so it's down here for a minute. My hand is getting tired here. She was the mayor. Can you just, can you imagine the, while you're still mayor, you're, you're causing a scene. I mean, you ever seen the movie The Mighty Ducks? Where, where Gordon Bombay led police on a high-speed chase, was driving drunk. He was charged for driving the open container. He was sentenced to, but, but. But during his condition, probation, special driver's license, and community service. During that time, that's what the court system does. It teaches you, hey, you know, can I be doing this? But there's things called AA meetings. You sit down and you go and you talk about the thing that the thing that alcohol did to you. It's like telling stories. Like in the episode of Family Guy where Where, um, I don't want to say this. Peter was, Peter and Mario were driving drunk, and during their sentencing time, they were, they were sentenced to AA meetings. During their time to discuss drunkenness, and then all that. That's what AA meetings do. It's all about getting rid of Mr. Booze. It stands for Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a physical pure, pure lead, uh, mutual aid fellowship begun in the U.S. occurred. Drafts based on recovery from alcoholism through the spiritually inclined 12-step program. It's still around for years. And many people, there's plenty of people out there 
it's been there for 98 years. If 98 years, it's been great and helpful to help people with, through alcohol. I mean, you know how, how hard it is to quit drinking. You may go cold turkey. But there's the 15... Let's look at the... Let's take a look at what... I don't know, I'm lost for words here. When we come back, I'm going to tell you the 15 threatening signs of alcoholism, and then we'll do our Bible break. Stay with us. Don't go away. We're talking about the abuse of alcohol after we saw a former mayor who was drunk and led police officers on a high-speed chase. The first one is drinking alone. The great percentage of alcoholics can be classed what we call social alcoholics. They prefer to have drinks with their friends. I don't think they're out the friends as a group. They're drinking because of the fact they're chasing the social feeling and drinking in a group. This kind of moral compass doesn't exist when you're drinking alone. Take note that there's a sudden change in someone's drinking routine from drinking in a group to something before they drink by themselves. The next one is breath. Like, we all see it. That's, that's the easiest one. You can... They just cover the breath mist to cover the smell and all. Justification of alcohol. Alcohol justified conversation of alcohol is a point of complete mania. They're prone to justify the type of alcohol they are drinking and will make up a range of excuses why they promise they will behave better. Refusal to admit a problem. This would be like. I'm not drunk. I just have a bit of pediment. And nausea and vomiting. Mood swings. Alcoholics are prone to mood swings. Like sometimes they're happy, calm, and quiet type of drunks, and mood swings will kick in when the alcohol runs out, saying, I want more. There's tolerance. It's also affected by other things, such as how you drink, how much you weigh, and genetic factors. And the habitability to stop. But you can't stop it. It's very difficult. You just continue going on and on and on and on until you realize, I need to stop. There's aggression. That's how alcoholics are. They're aggressive. Like some, that's, all, that's all we've seen. It's either drunk or on drugs. That's how aggression always is. It's like, oh, you want some of me? You want some of this? Like you're so sobered up, you want to start a fight. There's generally secret behavior. Secret behavior. Behavior that you would never know. Irrational decisions. Then there's depression for alcohol. You'll feel depression that you may drink or drink depression. The declining relationship, relationships. It's a very common type trope when you're dealing with an alcoholic. It's on something that can be gradually seen gradually over a long period of time. They'll call everyone who tries to get in the way of their addiction, including their closest friends and family. It's like, you can't help me. Get out of my face. But changes in the routine. It has disastrous effects, not only to the complete destruction of their family lives. Blackouts. Hangovers. We all know that from the hangover. Simple. If you black out, you stop. Cure a hangover, simple. Stop drinking. Then there's the shaking. That's the final one. If not going to show signs like this, they should immediately seek medical attention with drawing the assistance of a doctor. Cold turkey can be deadly. It can be deadly, but it's very effective. On a future show, we'll talk about, we'll talk about cold turkey. From alcohol to, to even smoking. So, that's the 15 signs of alcohol. If you experience these signs, please seek medical attention. And if you want to go cold turkey, go ahead and go cold turkey. But you didn't hear from me. Hugh Downs quit smoking. Back in the 19, back in the 1900s. He went cold turkey. Nobody knows how hard it is to quit smoking. You would have to go through hell to quit smoking. That's how it's all done, and we'll be right back.
Finally this evening, check out these two videos. This one from over a year ago, it had almost uh, 320 views. And then how about this one? Make you feel better. That loco. Make you feel better. We don't want to see that happening in every restaurant. And don't film it. Step in and break it. Break up the fight. Turn off the camera and don't keep recording. Actually, turn off the camera. Go in there and break it up. Simple. You're a bystander. People may say, well, don't you get hurt? You will eventually, but you're breaking up the fight. Go to an adult. Like, these school fights happen. We go to adults, and they take care of it by breaking up the fight. It is that simple. It's common sense that tells you, hey, I need to stop filming and go break up the fight before it gets out of hand. How does it get out of hand? Police. That's how it does. It gets out of hand when somebody films and posts on social media for lots of views. It's just how it is. It never stops. It happens every day when you're in a restaurant. It happens every day. That's Game Break for this Saturday going to Sunday. We'll see you again for Game Break Monday. For all of us here at YouTube, good night everyone.